Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. With pesticides, a little goes a long way, so you have some left at the end of the season. How long do pesticides last, and how should you store them? Also, canning tomatoes is a great way to enjoy your garden all winter. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by Goodwinds Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation. The WKNO Production Fund. The WKNO Endowment Fund. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Mr. D. Hello. And Kathy Faust will be joining us later to can tomatoes. All right, Mr. D, let's talk a little bit about pesticide lifespan, which is something I think that's important to talk about because now we're toward the end of the season. Folks are going to be putting up their pesticides for right, the year. Right, right. And most pesticides have a very, very long lifespan. Okay. I, I wouldn't uh, think that I have to replace pesticides every year. I mean, I've got pesticides that I use that are probably 10 or 15 years old. <laughs> oh, and okay. and uh, so so just you know, store them. Uh, it's probably best to store them in an area where they won't freeze, a cabinet or something <laughs> where they won't freeze that have some protection from the elements. But, uh, uh, you know, if a pesticide is a uh, taken off the market or for some reason you know that you'll never need it again, then I would wait for a household hazardous waste yeah. uh, event and you know make sure you dispose of mm -hmm. it that way. But other than that, the best way to, to, to dispose of a pesticide is to use it for its labeled purpose. Right. And uh, so you know you might want to get as small a container as you possibly can when you buy pesticides so that you will run out from time to time. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, you know, don't think just because it's two or three years old that it's not just as effective as it was the day it was, uh, you know, manufactured. Uh, and That's even with the, the, some of the research work that we do out there, we, we see that. We see that some of the older materials are very, very effective, uh, especially in our, some of our mode of action plots mm -hmm. where we use some, a lot of different kinds of pesticides where we're looking at symptomology on different okay. weeds and crops. and and we will we'll drag some pesticides out there that are very, very old and, and, and use them and they still work. So, long lifespan, you can check the label. Yeah, you don't, the I, label. I, I don't recall ever seeing uh, on the pesticide label where it has an expiration date. Me either, and that's, come to think of it. That's a reason, you know, because it probably didn't need an expiration date. I've had products so long that in plastic containers that the plastic container actually <laughs> cracked on yeah. me and, and so I, so I, I found you know a glass container to put it in uh, uh -huh. even though you're not supposed to do that you're supposed to keep the product in the container that is labeled okay but uh, you know uh, that makes sense so they'll last longer than the containers that they're in in some cases uh -huh. i'm a witness to that mm -hmm. what about products like bt or streptomycin well, streptomycin is an antibiotic, uh, so it's not living. The BT, uh, uh, I, I, you know, it would make sense that it's a bacteria and that it has a life, you know. And, and but again, I would check the label, really? and and you know, some bacteria, <laughs> you know, they they will live for Forever, a very right? very very long time <laughs> in the environment. There there is a, you know, a stage that they go through in a. In a capsule, encapsulated yeah. type thing, and I've got the correct terminology for that, a cyst or something, something that is very, very, uh, you know, impervious to, you know, the environment and, and, and can, they can last a very, very long time. But uh, I, that might be a little different from okay. most of the other pesticides. Okay. What about your fertilizers? Because you always see busted old bags of fertilizers. Same, the same way with fertilizers. The only problem with some of the fertilizers is when uh, they, a bag gets bust, you know, burst open, uh -huh. uh, it'll 
taking sometimes moisture from the air yeah. will come in and that can cause it to break down and, and volatize, for example, some of the nitrogen, yeah. if it's in a, can, can, you know, change to the ammonia form mm -hmm. of nitrogen, which is a gas. So that could reduce the uh, amount of N in, in some fertilizers. And also sometimes the moisture will cause them to, cake, you know, cake up yeah, and, and you know, form real, you know, big form rocks yes, and, and no, stones. And, and so you may have to break those up. So you may lose a little bit, but but I would probably still, if I could, go on and break those up and use them for whatever they need to be used for. Because right. I, I'd rather, uh, once again, use those products for their labeled use than send them to a landfill somewhere. You know, okay. um, if you do have to uh, do that, uh, then you need to wait for a household hazardous waste. You know collection, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. and do that. And I mean, I know here in Shelby County, we have a house yeah. hazard to a waste site out, out at Shelby Farms. Uh, and, and probably a lot of the areas do, uh, but be real careful. Another thing I want to throw in here too, okay. if you, if you do completely use the pesticide up, finish it up. And I think it'll sh tell you this on the label. You need to triple rinse the container, oh, that's a good point. You know, triple rinse it, put it into the spray mixture that you're, that you're mixing okay. up. And then you can, you know, throw that, that container in the garbage. Right. You know, you don't have to uh, put it in a household hazardous okay. uh, hazard. So you can yeah, recycle that. Can you have a plastic? Recycle, yeah, you can recycle, recycle it, the plastic, right? right. You can. If okay. you triple rinse it. You know. Yeah. I think it is on. I think I remember yeah, seeing Most it on of the some time, of the disposal, how yeah. to dispose uh, is, is on the label also. So okay. read that label. Is it a good idea to, you know, keep those fertilizers and those wettable powders off the ground? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you don't want them to be able to soak up moisture right. from the ground. So if you have a pallet or yeah. shelves, I like shelves, yeah, and, and shelves especially enough. cabinets where you can actually shut the doors and you do. can keep, you know, children and keep people mm -hmm. from getting to them. If you've got a locking cabinet, that would be good. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, up off the ground, you know, don't don't put them where they can soak up moisture sure. from, from the ground. And um, you need to kind of keep them inside, you know, in a, in a shop or a, a storage building, a little mm -hmm. storage building Let's outside would be fine. Okay. You know. All right. But yeah, just read the label. Follow that well, label. I'm, I'm read, sure. read and heed. Yeah. Read and heed. I like that. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure it's on that label. All right. Thanks, Mr. D. Appreciate that. Good deal. All right. There are a number of gardening events going on in the next couple of weeks. Here are just a few that might interest you. All right, Ms. Kathy, we're here at the Extension Office. Yes. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. And we're going to talk about canning tomatoes. Wonderful. How about that? Great. You know, it's tomato season, and we have these beautiful, fresh tomatoes okay. straight from Jones Orchard. Beautiful. So we're going to be canning these. Okay. And as you can see, I've got all of my equipment ready. It does take a little bit of preparation. You okay. have to go ahead and... Uh, we just pulled our hot jars out of the dishwasher. You don't need to sterilize the jars if you're canning something more than 10 minutes. But we went ahead and we got our, our jars there. They've cooled off a little bit. And we've had our uh, rings simmering mm -hmm. at 180 mm -hmm. degrees. Wow. And we've got our funnel ready, jar lifter, canning salt, uh, citric acid. But the first thing that you have to do is peel the tomatoes. Okay. And a really, really simple way to do this, and we just finished, we put the tomatoes in boiling water for about two minutes, and then we put Look them in that. ice water, and you can see how easily the peel comes off. Right, so we it comes just went white in. off. Hmm. Yeah, it just peeled off so easily. Nice. And after this point, we core them, chop them up really good, and then we put them in a big pot, and as you can see, I've got my pot right here. Okay. But it wasn't that easy. That I just went easy. ahead and got those taken care of. So what we've done here, we've gone ahead and we have simmered our tomatoes. Now these are, like we said, these are crushed tomatoes. And we're going to have these in the pressure canner for 15 minutes. If you were going to have them in a water bath canner, it would take much, much longer, okay. say 35 or 40 minutes. So what we're going to do here, uh, we don't normally pressure can tomatoes, but this, by doing it this way, we've saved up a little bit of time. Good. Like I said, I'm going to swap, swap gears here. Okay, you need me to hold, hold that? Me. I Thank can do you. that. I'm going to move this out of the way. Okay. 
And what we will do, thank you, mm -hmm. is go ahead and fill our jars to within one half inch. We want about one half inch head space here. And those tomatoes smell good, by the oh, way. Oh, yes, this, this has been nice. And you see, we didn't add any water. They made their own juice. Oh, so this is their own juice. Mm -hmm. It's a lot. Yeah, it made a lot of juice. Mm. And we're going to fill them to within one half inch of the top. And people ask, why do we do this? Well, if you don't give them enough head space, um, let's say if, if we just filled it and it had an inch and a half left, the top may become discolored and it, it might contract air and it mm. would not seal properly. Okay. And if we have too little head space, it might boil over during the process. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna go ahead and wipe the top of the jar and make sure that there's no seeds or anything up So good here. contact is most oh, important. Oh yeah, That's because what we're for. yeah, these lids have to fit just right. Okay. And we're gonna add one fourth teaspoon of citric acid. This is to the pints. And we're gonna add one half teaspoon of canning salt. See, one half teaspoon of canning salt to the pints. So what was the acid for? Why do we need to add that? Oh, it just, it kind of helps preserve it. Okay. You can also use lemon juice. You could use about a tablespoon of lemon juice. Now at this point, I'm gonna go ahead, this is my bubbler, and I'm gonna <laughs> stick this down. You might see a little bit of air bubbles coming out. Just, oh, this is, this just, is a, little, a few. just a few. Not as many as if you were yeah, doing green beans. So what we're gonna do, we've got our air bubbles out, and this is a handy little measurement tool. We're gonna measure one half inch head space. <laughs> nice. See, all the way around. That's about one half inch. And then we just add that lid right on top, and we wipe that. And then we get our bands, and we put these bands on just fingertip tight. Right. Okay. Yeah. Nice. I've, I've watched a lot of videos and sometimes they just put them on way, way, way too tight. And at this point, we're going to go ahead and put them in the pressure canner. And I'm going to put this in the pressure canner and then I want to talk to you a little bit about right. safety Good of deal. pressure canning. It's just right over here. And in our pressure canner, we've got about two inches of water. Now people call me all the time, they've never used a pressure canner and they're afraid of it. And they ask me, what, you know, what am I going to do? I might have one with the dial gauge or a weighted gauge. But this I, can, is, I can understand people being afraid oh, of that dog. Oh, I've heard I mean, horror I, I, stories about these things. You see, this has a little dial on it, okay. and you can come to our office and have this tested free of charge. We tested it five pounds, uh, 10 pounds, and 15 pounds of pressure. But okay. for our tomatoes, we're gonna use 11 pounds of pressure. If we were going to use a weighted gauge, we would use 10 pounds of pressure. Now you notice I've got a little piece of paper towel here one thing you want to do, if you'll hold this uh, for me, I can, please, I can. you want to oil the gasket. And we learned through trial and error, you, I think you were here that day, we couldn't get the lid off. I remember. And we <laughs> had to get Jim in here to get the lid off for us. But you want to go ahead and just rub this oil around the gasket. And also, when you have your gasket tested, uh, you want to make sure that it's not dry rotted. You can see this one's in pretty good shape. Mm -hmm. You also may want to run a string through this little vent. This is very important because what we're going to do is we're going to set the lid on top and once we secure it, we're going to let it vent for 10 minutes and you will see steam coming out of this vent. After the steam has um, escaped for 10 minutes, and that's very important. Uh, we're gonna put the petcock on top, and then we'll start building our pressure up. Usually on an electric range, it's at number seven mm -hmm. to maintain it at 11 pounds of pressure. And we'll start uh, timing it at 11 pounds, and we'll give it 15 minutes at 11 pounds of pressure. All right, Miss Kathy, special delivery. How Thank about that? you, Chris. One of the important factors of pressure canning is you have to realize the pressure canner is too heavy for a lot of women oh, to lift. It's heavy. So it's good to have a strong man <laughs> around to lift it off. I'm, I'm sure this weighed at least 25 pounds with the, all of the tomatoes in it. We appreciate you doing this. 
At this point, we are going to have to let it cool down. It will probably take about 40 minutes for it to wow. cool down. All right, Miss Kathy, now it's been 40 minutes. So let's see the product. Okay, right. thank you, Chris. I was really surprised that it cooled down so quickly because normally it takes a little bit longer. When it gets down to zero, we give it an additional 10 minutes. Okay. So we, we're sure that it has cooled down. We're going to take the right. pet cock off and then we're going to can open get our that? lid. I can, oh, it's so easy because remember when we oiled it? That's why oh, okay. it's so easy to That's open. That's why you do that. And you want to open it away from you. Okay. It's still pretty hot. Wow. And we're going to take these jars out, and I see them bubbling. They're so, already uh, popping. I, heard one I pop. hear them popping. Yeah, I sure did. Okay, and you see how the liquid is on the bottom. That will settle after a few days. So we want to put these uh, out of the way of a draft. You don't want a draft. And we're just going to leave these undisturbed for about 12 hours. 12 hours. Now, if we were doing a canning class, like we've been doing recently, <laughs> what we would have. Uh, we would let everyone go ahead and take theirs home after okay, they sure. had cooled down a tiny bit. But um, and it smells. You can still smell it. I know, it and you can see good. we've. There goes another pop. I heard it. And then you can store these for up to two years. We tell people we want them to consume them within one to two years. I've talked to people who have said, "Oh, you know, I found some in grandmother's pantry from ten years ago," mm -hmm. and I would not recommend <laughs> eating them, but. You know, That's a long time. Some people do. Mm -hmm. uh, if we had used quartz, we would have used a half teaspoon of the um, citric acid and one teaspoon of the canning salt. Okay. So, but we still would have pressure canned them for 15 minutes, pints or quartz. So, All right, then, Miss Kathy, you appreciate that demonstration. Thank you, right. Chris. Thank you much. We, success. There hey, goes number another four. One. Right. Okay, I think that's all Good five. Doing. Yeah, I think I heard five pops. Okay, thank you. Okay, so talking about how butterflies feed. Um, butterflies feed a little bit differently than we think of feeding. Um, they taste with their feet. So um, that'd be a little gross if people did that, but for butterflies, they're finding a really good landing source. Then they have a long curly tongue called a proboscis that they're gonna stick down into the flower to pull out the nectar. Some good plants in this area to plant. Springtime, you wanna look at milkweeds, not only a nectar source, but also for caterpillars. In the summer, you wanna look at something maybe like mist flower, and then plant some goldenrods and some blazing star for fall feeding butterflies. All right, Mr. D, here's our Q&A session. Some good questions here. Let's mm -hmm. start with our first viewer email. Each year in August and September, I have a terrible problem. Well, it looks like tiny black seeds drop from my pecan tree into my pool and stain it. What are these seeds? Also, these bags of caterpillars form at the same time on the tree. Are the seeds from the tree itself or from the worm sacs? And what can I do to stop or minimize them? And this is from Jude. A couple of things going on here. I think I know what you're going to say, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what do you think about those tiny black seeds that are dropping into the pool? Don't eat them. Don't eat them. Don't eat them. <laughs> I would say that I'm pretty safe to assume uh, that they are coming from not the tree, but from the caterpillars. Uh, from the caterpillars, and that's it's right. it's probably worm poo-poo, wouldn't you say? I would say so. <laughs> uh, so I don't know that I would eat them. I, I probably wouldn't eat them, and I wouldn't particularly want to be swimming with them. No. Uh, yeah, fall web worms. Yeah, uh, fall web they, worms. They, they do a lot of feeding. They're voracious feeders, and, you know, anything that eats a lot, Poops a lot. Poops a lot. You know, you know, if you have kids, you understand that. I do. You know? uh, but uh, you know, the, try to control the. If you tr try to control the fall webworms, and you know, BT is uh, one of the products that's recommended for fall webworms. And, and if you put BT in a hose in sprayer and try to yeah. cover the tree as much as you can before you see before. the webworms, okay. yeah, because the, the, they're there before you see the web formed sure. and, and they're feeding and they're little and they're easy to kill. So, you know, sometime yeah. earlier Early. than when you normally start to see these black seeds fall in the <laughs> swimming pool, <laughs> right. uh, go out there with a hose in sprayer and be sure that BT is there waiting on those fall webworms <laughs> and spray it, as cover as much of the tree right. as you can and, and that should help you probably as much as anything. And I guess when it rains, do you have to reapply? Oh yeah, when it rains, it reapply, and I, and I do that you know, two or three times, 
And the good thing about it is you BT is so safe, you don't have yeah, to worry about a little product. bit of, of it dripping off in your pool. It's a lot safer than the little black seeds. No, that's right. right. <laughs> the little black seeds probably may have E. coli in them. Oh, boy, I didn't think about that. It's a possibility. That. You know, you know. Think about that. It's a possibility. Of course, you've got, that. I'm sure you've got chlorine, chlorine in, in, the, in, pool. The, in right. the pool that, that might help you out there. But. All right, Jill, we hope that helps you out. Okay. Yeah, yeah, stay away got, from that. I, I'm yeah. really afraid. I'm worried about a certain pecan tree. I'm afraid it's about to get cut down. Oh, you boy. Know, you know, over the pool, right? Over the pool. <laughs> over the pool. Yeah. All right, here's our next viewer email. How do you cure blossom and rot on tomatoes? You seem to get a lot of tomato questions, you know, toward the end of the season, huh? Right. Blossom right. and rot. And yeah. we all know that's what calcium deficiency. Calcium deficiency. You know, be careful with blossom and rot that you don't treat the symptoms rather than yeah. the problem itself. And, yeah. And that is a calcium deficiency, and and if and it, it may be possible that you have an adequate, you know, enough calcium in the soil, and if you have dry conditions, mm -hmm. really dry conditions, sometimes the plant is unable to take calcium up, right. and you can have some blossom in right that. So, yeah. So so because calcium moves real slow in the plant, it moves very slowly really, in the really plant. Really uh, so for that reason, uh, you know, during dry conditions, irrigate, mm -hmm. you know, water your your tomatoes if you can. And uh, but but make sure you soil test. Make sure yeah. your pH is right and you've got calcium. Your calcium levels are up where they need to be. Right. And uh, you shouldn't have any problem. And I mean, you can buy products called Stop Rot that are calcium yeah. chloride and all that. But if you do that, and you're basically tr treating the symptom mm -hmm. of the problem, and it it's probably going to give you very little relief yeah. because it moves so slowly. Calcium moves so slowly so in slow. the plant. And something else I like to add to that too, mulch, because it helps mm -hmm. regulate soil moisture. Right. Right. Yeah. And it can. Yeah, conserve soil yeah. moisture, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so I, I would yeah. do that. Maltose yeah. tomatoes, that's yeah. right. Standard question you get toward the end of the season. Yep. Seems like yep. always tomato Blossom questions. Blossom and rot. Yeah, yep. Blossom and rot. All right, here's our next viewer email. I have a well-established blueberry plant in the ground. Can I move it to a container? The container I'm thinking about is two feet wide and 18 inches deep. And this is from Matt in Midtown. So he wants to move the blueberry from the ground to a container. What do you think about that? I would guess, and I don't know, I would guess that Max Matt. bought a house that had this blueberry already there, mm. and he wants to move it, and I would say no, don't no. don't try it. I would okay. say no, okay. because it's not the easiest thing in the world to get a well-established blueberry. Mm. You have to have the soil conditions right. You've got to have a low pH between 4.8 right. and 5.2 pH. You have to have uh, which is hard to get which is hard to get yeah. you've got to usually yeah. add elemental sulfur to the area to get the ph mm -hmm. low enough then you've got to uh at planting you need to add two or three good shovelfuls of a good sphagnum yeah. canadian peat moss into the planting hole to get the organic matter good in that planting hole so whoever did planted that blueberry plant did all that okay. and they got they've got that going good and blueberry plants if they're the rabbit eye types that we recommend in this area, mm -hmm. they're going to get 20 feet tall. It's pretty good size. If you let them, yeah. if you don't prune them. And so you're talking about digging this plant up and putting it in a container, container that you are putting potting soil in there. And uh, is the potting soil going to be the right pH? Uh -huh. Is it going to have the right amount of organic matter? Uh, if he wants one in that container, I would suggest that he go buy a small blueberry plant and plant it in the container. But leave that one established alone. Leave it there if you can, unless it's in an area that you're, that you're uh, going to build onto the house mm -hmm. or, you know, you, that you need that area for something else. I don't recommend trying to, to move a well-established blueberry plant. Now, if you have blueberry plants that you planted two or three years ago and you didn't do all those things that I suggested <laughs> you do, uh -huh. if they're still alive, they're just sitting there and they're not growing. Okay. So you do that. dig those up right. and put them in a pot, but make sure the pH is right and, and all that is right. Anything that's well established, I always tell folks to leave it. Leave it alone. Because my concern, one of my concerns is if you're going to dig it up, you're not going to get all the root system anyway. No. So you, you got to, you know, the, the root, si root system on most plants, including trees, mm -hmm. go out about one and a half right. times the height mm -hmm. of the plant. So that means if that blueberry plant is three feet tall, then it's got three plus one and a half, four and a half yeah. feet at least out, out yeah. from the base of that plant. It may be further because they're going to go in the top soil. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, there's that, and you're talking about how large is the container? Yeah, two, two feet, feet wide. wide, 18 inches deep, yeah. not big enough. No, you're not going mm -hmm. to work. Mm -hmm. Not going to work. Mm -hmm. All right, Matt. So, so uh, you know, 
Hope that helps. Hope that helps. Yeah. Hope we saved the blueberry plant. We yep. may have killed a pecan tree. <laughs> yeah, maybe, yeah. Saved the blueberry. Maybe we saved the blueberry plant. <laughs> All right, Mr. D. Thanks a lot. Appreciate that. Good deal. All right. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org, and the mailing address is familyplot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. You can get tomato canning instructions at familyplotgarden.com. While you're there, take a look at the gardening calendar. There are dozens of events all over the state this month. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by Goodwin's Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation The WKNO Production Fund The WKNO Endowment Fund and by viewers like you. Thank you.